Hi, I'm Linda Eaton. I'm the curator of textiles here at Winterton Museum. I've co-curated an exhibition called Who's Your Daddy? Families in Early American Needlework with two of our graduate students here at Winterthur, Alison Bookbinder and Samantha Dorsey. I've pulled a few objects that relate to the use of needlework in learning more about families and particularly women in early America. The first group of things I have today relate to the Washington family. And the Washingtons were very proud of their connection with, of course, George Washington. Martha and George didn't have any children of their own, but Martha had married George as a widow with children, and her granddaughter, Eleanor Lewis, made an amazing painted velvet book a notebook for her son Lorenzo, made in 1827. Now people can be a little snooty about painted velvet today, but in the past it was one of the fancy work art forms that many women learned at school, although we know from Eleanor's letters that she learned it herself. She taught herself from instruction books. The, what's so special about this notebook is that it is lined with silk cut from dresses worn by Martha Washington, um, a specific dress worn at one of George's last birthday parties. Because the Washingtons were so very important, relics have been kept of their clothing and other objects associated with them. And so the fabrics on the far side of the table here are two examples of fabric cut from Martha's dresses possibly cut out and given to friends and relatives by Nellie or Eleanor herself. And then the yellow fabric here on the table is something a little bit different. It's part of a set of bed hangings from um, a house in Newburyport, Massachusetts. And the story of these bed hangings is that both Washington and Lafayette slept in this bed, but not at the same time. And so these were carefully saved as relics of these important heroes of the Revolution. And scraps were cut up and given to friends, relatives, and other people in the neighborhood. The first theme of exhibition is all about how families can serve as symbols of status in society. One of the ways they can do that is through coats of arms. And with that, you think of European nobility and you think of these wonderful coats of arms on carriages and in, on houses and in architecture. But in America, there was a tradition of young women working needlework and filigree coats of arms. I have two pieces here that are not in the exhibition. One is the most amazing late 17th century filigree coat of arms made by the daughter of a merchant in Boston, Benjamin Smith, and it's dated 1693, a really incredible rare survival. This is also a technique that's sometimes known as quill work, um, and it was widely made in America, but very few of them survived, particularly from such an early date. The next piece I have here is a canvas work or a tent stitch coat of arms from Boston from the mid 18th century. It was worked by one of the daughters of Boston goldsmith, William Simpkins and his wife, Elizabeth Sims, and both of their names are there on the coat of arms. It's a beautiful piece made right before the American Revolution. But just after the revolution, women were still working coats of arms and the exhibition there's an example worked by Betsy Putnam together with the watercolor that was used um, as the pattern for her piece. She worked the Putnam coat of arms. She was very proud of her family heritage because her grandfather was Israel Putnam. He was the general that's credited with saying at the Battle of Bunker Hill, don't shoot until you see the whites of their eyes. Families are also a sign of your respectability, and that was very true for a needlework teacher named Leah Gallagher. All of these samplers were worked at her school. The first one here was worked by Sarah Holsworth, and it's a very unusual piece because right in this top text block, where normally Sarah would have put information about her own family, who her mother and father were, perhaps a sibling or two, 
Instead, she's given the family history of her teacher, Leah Gallagher. She worked this in 1799, and the question is, why would she have her teacher's um, family history there? And why we think it's there is because her teacher, very soon after this, was involved in a very scandalous and public divorce that played out in the newspapers of Lancaster, the city where they all lived. And so here Sarah is talking about the respectability and the uh, family history of her teacher, probably in order to make sure that that teacher was seen as a respectable person and she could attract more girls to her school. The other two are worked by two sisters, Martha and Elizabeth Taylor at Leah Gallagher's school in Lancaster. They're wonderful pieces. Um, Martha worked hers when she was nine years old and Elizabeth worked hers when she was 12, um, which is amazing really when you think of the extraordinary quality of um, their needlework. Amazingly enough, I do have a silhouette of Martha taken a little bit later in her life when she was about 30 at Peel's Museum in Philadelphia. So she obviously went in to visit the city and had her silhouette taken. It's important to remember that a lot of times needlework only survives because it's been treasured by subsequent generations in a family. And we are looking at a group of things that was um, saved by many generations of the Alsop family. All of these pieces were made by Mary Wright Alsop who was a woman who lived um, through the 18th century and died in the early 19th century in her 80s. Um, she made a number of these uh, pieces at different stages of her life. This Queen Stitch pocket book has got a date in there of 1774. She made this just before her marriage in 1776 to Richard um, Alsop. A lot of these were made for her children and her grandchildren after she was widowed. She and her husband were married for 16 years. They had um, 10 children, eight of them surviving into adulthood. The earliest pieces that Mary did are the two Queen Stitch pocketbooks. After she married, she made a lot of fancy articles using the technique of knitting. So all of these other beautifully colored things are very, very fine knitting, including this one pocket book that has got the most gorgeous chine or clouds. This is um, fabric um, that it's lined with. She put her own name, M. Alsop, and 74. She was 74 years old when she made this and she was proud of it. This group of bags were called purses um, by Mary at the time. They're little drawstring bags. We're not quite sure what they use them for. Um, women's bags were often called reticules, but this one was made for John Alsop in 1812. What would a man do with such a beautiful purse, knitted purse? Now, the knitting is just so incredibly fine. It's completely unlike the scarves that people knit today with big, thick needles. And I do have here some of the needles or knitting pins in a silver case that are contemporary with Mary, although these were not owned by her. Mary's family treasured these for many generations. And these kinds of mementos are very personal things that came down through generations of a family and just show how important the nature of that family was to its members. These are just a few of the highlights from Winterthur's extraordinary collection of American needlework and highlights of our exhibition, Who's Your Daddy? Families in Early American Needlework.